Hello. Welcome, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? This is a weird placement for a mic for me, so. Uh, welcome to our, our first uh, public lecture of this season, which uh, we put flyers out that have the schedule for the next six months, so if you didn't get it, uh, you're welcome to grab a copy of that. We also put out uh, some posters of supernovae taken with the Chandra Space Telescope that you're welcome to take home with you, if you'd like. Uh, as I said, this is our first in the, in the next six months of, of lectures and stargazing that we'll be having. How many here are first-time visitors? Oh, wow. How did people find out about this? Facebook. The first-time visitors are mostly Facebook or Twitter. Uh, raise your hand if you're Facebook. Raise your hand if you, you learned about it through Twitter. Raise your hand if you learned about it from a friend. Okay. Any other weird ways that you learned about it? Oh, the flyer. Okay, that's a weird way, I suppose. Um, excellent. Uh, and if you go to the website that's listed on our flyer uh, here at Caltech, it also has a, in addition to our listings for the public lectures, we also have something that we just started up that last month called Astronomy on Tap, uh, which for those of you who are of age to drink adult beverages are welcome to attend. Uh, this is where we have short informal public lectures at a local bar. Uh, in this case, it's at the Der Wolfskopf pub, which is in Old Town, Pasadena. But if you go to the website or search for Astronomy on Tap, you can, uh, you can find out more information about that. It's super fun. We had a great turnout last month. And it's two weeks from this Monday. Yeah, there, there's still some seats on this side if you guys want to sit. Uh, observing, it looks very clear outside. We should have good observing. Unfortunately, there's some construction being done next to the main entrance that we normally go onto the fields from. Um, I'll put up a map after the talk with generally the route you'll want to take, but just if you can picture it in your mind's eye, you'll go out the front door and go on the sidewalk next to the street, turn left, and then turn left uh, before the next building, and you'll see that the telescopes are set up. There will also be a person who can kind of lead you out there uh, to the telescopes. They should be observing uh, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the Moon, the Ring Nebula, maybe the Hercules cluster, so some really cool stuff. But I encourage you not to use your cell phones when you're out there because the bright blue light from the cell phone will hurt your night vision and make it harder for you to see when you see through the telescope. And furthermore, uh, I encourage not everybody to rush to get outside because after the talk, which is about 30 minutes, there will be both um, a panel question and answer session with some of the resident astronomers who are here on various different special topics. So you can ask to all your heart's desire the questions that you have burning about science and astronomy. And uh, that will be going on until 10, as will the observing. So you can, you can come in, listen to this for a while, ask some questions, go outside, come back in as you desire. Uh, and I think that's about all in terms of announcements. Now to introduce our speaker. Our speaker for tonight is me. <laughs> um, so I'm Cameron Hummels. Uh, I'm a postdoc here. And let's see, what do I normally do for background of speakers? When I introduce a speaker, I normally say uh, they, where they went to school and what sort of science they do. So I went to Pomona College as an undergraduate just down the road. And then, uh, and then I did my PhD at Columbia University in New York, and now I'm a, a postdoc here, and I mostly do computer simulations of galaxy evolution, which is part of what I'm going to talk to you guys about. And I'm really involved in outreach, which is part of why this is all going on. So, uh, Okay, so simulating the universe on a supercomputer. Very matrixy here. Quick outline of the talk. I'm going to... Can you guys see it okay? I'm going to drop the lights a little bit. Okay. That's a little bit better. So, very quickly, why do we use simulations in physics in general, but specifically in astrophysics? How do we actually simulate physical systems? What do we simulate? And on what sort of computers are we doing these simulations? So, first off, why do we use simulations in astrophysics? Well, why do we... What, what's the whole point of science? Can I get a, a really, this isn't a rhetorical, what's a, what's a quick response to? What, why do we do science? Why is science out there? Understanding the universe. Understanding the universe. Very good. Very, very uh, succinct. Yes. 
we, we do science to better understand the nature of nature, how, science, how, how nature uh, evolves, how nature creates a variety of things. So here's this beautiful scene of, of the natural world. And scientists might ask, why are there mountains? Why is there snow? Why is it colder on the tops of mountains as opposed to down in valleys? Why do trees grow? Why do clouds form? What are clouds made of? All of these things are, are, are questions that can be addressed by science. And how do we address them? With the, with the, I won't ask that because I'll get lots of shouts back. Um, but with the, the scientific method. And I'm sure everybody remembers back in their science class of, of doing the scientific method where you form a hypothesis, you set up an experiment with initial conditions, you run that experiment, get some sort of results, and then analyze those results to, to conclude whether or not your initial hypothesis, your, your initial guess of understanding that something is correct, and if it's not, how you can, how you can change that, how you can modify it to make it uh, better, and then redo this over and over and over again until you finally, at the end, hopefully understand something about whatever system you were experimenting on. In terms of astrophysics, most of what we know about the cosmos we get from light that's traveled from those objects to us. And we can't, per se, set up experiments in the same way that other natural sciences can. We can't set up a galaxy like, like the Andromeda galaxy here and a star over here and just run it forward because I don't have the power to move galaxies around or stars around. Do, do you guys? Uh, and even if we could, the timescales associated with these things changing and evolving are so long that we'd have to be waiting over the course of a lifetime or longer. For, for a galaxy like the, like the Andromeda galaxy to evolve any st substantial amount takes millions or sometimes billions of years. So, it, yeah, it's just not realistic for us to do these sorts of experiments on astrophysical phenomena. But it is inside of a computer. In a computer, you can make a virtual experiment. You can make a virtual space and set up your initial conditions in whatever way you desire, as long as you program in uh, appropriate physical laws, and then you can, you can run it forward and you, you can accelerate time to see how it might evolve and produce whatever it is that you're trying to study. So, to run virtual experiments, that's why, one of the reasons why we, do, we use simulations in astrophysics. Furthermore, when we run these simulations, if, if I'm doing a simulation of you know, how these galaxies are evolving or, or how, how to form something like this, this galaxy, and I'm actually able to do that, it's indicative that I really have a, a good grasp of what's happening in that system. I mean, I programmed in the physical laws, I programmed in the initial conditions, and then I ran it, and I was able to produce that. That tells me that I hopefully really understand what's going on in that system because I, I, I created that system. So it helps us not just to, to, uh, to run these experiments to better, but to better understand the natural world. And finally, if we take these astrophysical systems and we're evolving them forward in time and running them forward in time, we can run them forward past the present time into the future. And that's actually super cool because it means we can predict the future, which is like magic. If you can predict the future, it's pretty spectacular. So, so for all these reasons, we run simulations uh, to try and better understand the natural world. Okay, so how do we actually simulate physical systems? We'll just give a, a quick rundown with our handy dandy computer here. <laughs> we, uh, we write a, a program using, uh, creating some sort of virtual space inside of our computer. And we'll get more into that in a moment. We program in, just like any experiment, we program in our initial conditions. We program in whatever dominant physical laws we think should be, should be acting in our particular simulation. And, you know, you might think, let's program in all the physical laws. But unfortunately, with the computational power that we have, even the best supercomputers that we have, if you program in all the physical laws and have infinite spatial resolution in your models, you won't make any progress at all. We just don't have the computing power to do it. So if you came thinking that we were going, I was going to be talking about how the matrix, we're all living inside a computer program. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the computational power or the algorithms yet capable of modeling things as complex as that, uh, especially the complexity of free will and how 
people interact with each other, which is beyond what I study. And then we run it forward in time, and hopefully out comes science. So this is pretty vague, but so let's, how do we actually simulate physical systems? So I'm going to give an example that, uh, that most of you, in fact, all of you should be relatively familiar with, if not in necessarily these kind of formalistic terms, but that is the equations of motion, which is essentially how do objects move? We interact with moving objects every day. So, keep, keep, uh, stay patient through this. This is, the equation stuff will be relatively short, but I just wanted to give some formal background. So, at time t, any object, and we'll use, we'll use this bouncy ball, which lights up to make it even more spectacular. Uh, any object possesses a position in space, a velocity, which is just a fancy word for speed, but with a direction, and an acceleration that I'm representing here as x, v, and a. So, any object is going to have a position, and we'll just represent position in the x direction here. So this is position 0, 1 foot, 2 foot, 3 feet, and so on and so forth. And when we give something a velocity, or when we give it a speed, we're essentially telling it how that position is going to change with time. And we give it, when we give it an acceleration, we're telling how velocity changes with time. Okay, so the key point to simulating physical systems is to break up time, at least in this case, breaking up time, and usually in uh, simulations, break up time into discrete steps, to break it into individual steps. That is to say, take something that's in motion, start at your initial conditions, move it forward in time just a little bit, like a second, or a half of a second, and, and see how far it's moved and how, what its acceleration has done and what its position has changed, and then reevaluate those equations at that new point in time and see what its new velocity should be and its new acceleration and its new position. And do that forward, and essentially what you're doing is approximating how things move by breaking them into these discrete steps. And yeah, this is basically what I just said. At each new time, we can calculate the new position or velocity based on the ra uh, using the previous position, velocity, and acceleration. So, a concrete example, a stationary ball. This stationary ball, we'll set it on the table here. I'm going to hold on to it because who knows what's going to happen when I release it. We give it a position of x equals zero, which is to say it's just sitting here at this position. We give it a velocity of zero. That is to say I'm not going to hit it and cause it to give it any speed whatsoever. And it has an acceleration of zero, which is formally true. It is being accelerated towards the, towards the center of the Earth, but the table is counteracting, so it doesn't have any net acceleration on it at this moment. So what do you guys think is going to happen if I release this ball? It'll stay there. It'll stay there. I gave it away with stationary ball. <laughs> so we release it, and for the most part, it stays, stays there. <laughs> There's a little tilt to the table. But what we can do is at time equals zero, we give it our initial conditions. At time equals one, we evaluate. We multiply the velocity of it times that time step that we have. One second, we'll, we'll call our time step one second. But it doesn't have any velocity, so it doesn't move. It doesn't change its position. And it doesn't have an ex any acceleration, so it doesn't change its velocity. So that's a really boring example. Let's do something that's a little bit more interesting. A rolling ball. Same initial conditions, same position, same acceleration, but now we give it an initial velocity. We, we give it an initial velocity of one foot per second. So we're, I'm going to hit this so it's traveling and it's covering one foot per second. And then we'll say that the time step associated with it is one second. So how far should it travel? This is not a trick question. How far should it travel in one second? One foot, exactly. So I'll see if I can do one foot per second. That's roughly one foot per second. And if, this, if we were simulating this, as we do here, this is the ball, this is the x-axis of the table, and this is the time. So we run it forward in time steps, and at each one-second interval, we reevaluate its position and its velocity. Again, it's a pretty boring example, but I wanted to start simple before we get into more interesting things. We can also shrink that time step, and it actually gives us better behavior. It's more computations to make, but, um, but it should give a better result. So if we do this, all I'm going to do is change it so the time step, instead of being one full second, is one one-hundredth of a second. 
So in one one hundredth of a second, a ball traveling at one foot per second, how far should it go after one one hundredth of a second? One one hundredth of a foot. And then we, re, we reevaluate how far it, or what its new uh, position, velocity, and acceleration is after one one hundredth of a second, and then after two one hundredths of a second, and so on and so forth. And we get more smooth behavior of the ball as it travels across the table. Okay, so this is all pretty boring, and you're like, why did I drive 30 minutes to come see this? <laughs> um, here's a, a potentially a more interesting example, a bouncing ball. Now, I've represented two balls here in, the, in my simulation. Uh, one that has the black arrow that's traveling to the right has an initial side velocity to it. So we can, it, you'll, you'll see it, it demonstrates the motion a little bit better. And blue represents the acceleration. Because now, our ball is being accelerated to the ground. I'm going to drop it from two and a half meters. That's why this is at two and a half meters. Um, which I calibrated to be the height that I can reach when I reach to the top here. Uh, and we're going to drop it and see what happens. And of course, you guys have all played with these things before. You probably know what's going to happen. But we can make, we can make calculations about this. We have, now we have an acceleration. Uh, we have a, a position in y in the y direction as opposed to the x direction, y just being the vertical axis, which we can treat the same way. And let's make a prediction. We'll run it forward, and you can see the black arrow representing the velocity vector is, is preceding that ball. Now, I've added in an extra piece of physics, and that is when the ball reaches the ground, it strikes the ground and it translates its downward velocity into upward velocity, or else this would be a really boring simulation. It would fall and it would stop. Um, so, so we have this prediction. So let's see how accurately this prediction holds up. So if I hold it up here, and I'm not watching, so you guys will have to... Is it bouncing at the same rate? Oh, now it lost a little bit there, but... But, for the most part, we can predict how this thing is going to behave with time simply by taking discrete individual time steps and calculating what the new position, the new velocity, and in this case, it's the same acceleration that's acting each time, but seeing how that changes over time. Future predicted. We <laughs> predicted the future. It's not a very interesting future, but we did predict the future. So, let's get on to something more interesting. Let's talk about astrophysical systems. And this will be the last equation of the talk, so fear not. Um, gravity. Everyone's familiar with gravity. Gravity is what's holding us to the surface of the Earth. But in astrophysical systems, gravity, gravity basically is a force that attracts anything that has mass to anything else that has mass. If there are two objects, me and this ball, for instance, we each possess matter, we each possess mass. We're pulling towards each other. It's, I'm pulling towards it, and it's pulling towards me. It's not very much, because as you can see, the acceleration that we're being pulled by gravity is proportional to the mass of the other object. So, for instance, this isn't very massive, so it's not pulling me towards it very much, or it's not pulling you towards it. But the Earth is very massive, and that's why we're being pulled towards the Earth so dramatically. But in our own small way, we're pulling the Earth back towards us. Not very much, but we're doing it, nonetheless. And you may also see that there's an x squared here. Remember, x is our position. So the, the acceleration is proportional, it's inversely proportional to the, the distance separating the two objects, which is to say the closer two objects are together, the more they're accelerated to each other. So even though the sun is a million times more massive than the Earth, so it should have an enormous acceleration on us, it's much, much, much farther away than the Earth is to us. And so it's not pulling on us quite so much as the Earth, which is very close, even though it's not as massive. Okay, so what does this mean? It means if we take two stars that are represented here as red dots, the, there's a mutual acceleration from both of them on each other. And the closer they are, the blue, the blue, uh, blue arrow represents the acceleration, the closer they are, the more they're accelerating each other towards each other, if that's an English sentence. Um, but let's, again, let's see a demonstration of this. So here's an example. We've got the sun in the middle. This is not to scale. The sun in the middle, 
and the Earth over here. The distance separating them is called an astronomical unit, which is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, but it's several million miles. Um, I'll give them no initial velocity, and the acceleration is just calculated by gravity. And remember, gravity is an attractive force, so this is being pulled that way, and the Earth is being pulled towards the Sun. So let's see, what, what do you guys think is going to happen? Boom. Boom. Good. Okay. So we run it forward, and boom! Uh, the Earth runs into the Sun. Don't worry. This isn't how things are. But, but if you'll see, I'll just slow this down for a bit. If you'll see, initially what happens is whoa, the, blue, the blue arrow represents the acceleration. The Earth is being accelerated more towards the Sun than the Sun is being accelerated towards the Earth because the Sun is more massive. And that acceleration is causing that black arrow, the velocity vector, to grow with time. As they get closer, the blue arrow gets more because, remember, the closer things are, the more acceleration there is between them. And finally, they just run into each other. Okay. Don't worry, though. The Earth actually does have some velocity that is traveling transverse <coughs> to the direction of the Sun. So this is the exact same simulation, but it's done where we give the Earth a little bit of velocity, and so it starts to travel in an orbit around the Sun. And again, we're doing at each discrete time step, we're calculating the equations of motion, we're, we're calculating what the position, the velocity, and the, and the acceleration are, we're just using our acceleration to be calculated by gravity. And you notice that always the blue arrow from the Earth, the acceleration of the Earth is towards the Sun, and always the acceleration of the Sun towards the Earth is, it, or the acceleration of the Sun is towards the Earth but the velocity is, is not in that same direction. The speed is not in that same direction, which means that in the time that it takes the Earth to move one time step here, that velocity vector is pulled closer to the Sun, but it's traveled in distance, so it's always perpendicular. So it remains in this nice little orbit. Okay, so that, again, isn't that interesting, but this is kind of interesting. So I wrote this code that we're looking at these silly little simulations in Python yesterday just to demonstrate this stuff. And on my laptop, I was able to calculate the trajectory of the Juno probe that happened on Monday. Did you guys follow this? Juno was this, uh, this probe that NASA sent into space five years ago, and eventually it made it to Jupiter, and it made it to Jupiter on the 4th of July, just on Monday. So here is the Sun, here is the Earth and Juno, and here is Jupiter. Again, not to scale, because my simulation code is not fancy. Uh, and here's Juno traveling outward in its orbit. Earth is going in its orbit. Each orbit is one year because that's how the Earth works. And Juno sneaks in there and gets a gravitational assist out into the outer solar system on its way to hitting Jupiter. And it takes a while because they're moving pretty slowly and that's a long distance. And boom! Juno enters or Jupiter's orbit. That's pretty cool. We were I mean, I don't have a million dollar budget to do all these things with the supercomputer. Well, I mean, I can use a supercomputer, but I did this on my laptop. So we're able to predict the future about how Juno got all the way out to Jupiter. One second. Um, so how do we actually simulate physical systems? By approximating solutions to certain physical equations and discretizing time. So breaking time into individual chunks and reevaluating the nature of the system at each of those chunks as we move forward. It's not always time, but oftentimes it is. So what sort of things do we simulate? Uh, along the lines of what I was just demonstrating with that simple simu uh, simulation code that I wrote, there was work done in the 1970s, kind of the pioneering work by Toomeray and Toomeray, that did this for trying to showcase how you get certain structures, which aren't showing up very well here. I'm going to darken it just a hair. Don't worry, I'll turn the lights back on in a moment. Um, so you can see when galaxies are interacting with each other, you get these bridges and tails that come off them. And no one really understood why this was the case until they did simulations, much like, much like the ones that I just showed, where you have two uh, galaxies that are represented as a number of individual mass points of mass, like, like my ball here, and then allow them to interact gravitationally with the equations of motion, 
And so this is like a time series. So it starts out like this, and it goes forward in time, and eventually you're able to form these bridges that connect the two. And it's just the effects of gravity on massive objects that are rotating like these galaxies are. Actually, I'll leave the lights off for a moment. We can incorporate hydrodynamics into our simulation. Hydrodynamics are just uh, they're the physical theory for how gases interact with each other and behave. They're quite a bit more complicated than the, than the equations governing gravitation. However, uh, they can still be broken down and discretized into these uh, approximations and approximate solutions in the same way that we did for those very simple equations, the equations with gravity. And so kind of a combination of those, this is a nice video of the merger between our own Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest massive neighbor. And you can see here is a time, a, a time scale from the future of these two objects interacting. So here's the Milky Way, here's Andromeda, this is the Triangulum galaxy. And they are on a crash course. They are moving towards each other and will merge at some point in the future. It's like six billion years off, so we don't really have to worry, but it is going to happen. And so this simulation incorporates gravity and hydrodynamics, done by some colleagues of mine, uh, and you can see what happens when they merge. You get these, again, those tidal tails, those bridges and tails that come off the systems, but then they eventually coalesce into a single galaxy, which people tend to call milk Amada because it's Milky Way and Andromeda merged together. So you see this galaxy that results is quite a bit different looking than either of uh, the progenitors. And it tends to be redder because it's more made of older stars. Young stars tend to be blue, uh, but during that merger you blow out a lot of the, the fuel for star formation, so there aren't a lot of young stars being made afterwards. And you just have a stellar population that's made of old stars, so it tends to be redder. But again, this is 8 billion years in the future, so don't sell your stock yet. Uh, few, uh, furthermore, they, they were able to put together images of what the night sky would look like. So here's the, the Milky Way that people are potentially familiar with, and here's Andromeda getting bigger in the sky until it's enormous, and then there's the merger going on, and then when you look up in the night sky, you just see this kind of haze of, uh, of reddish stars in the galaxy Milkomeda. But this, again, this is 8 billion years in the future, so don't worry about it. But the point is, future predicted... <laughs> Future predicted. Um, okay, what else do we simulate? So more galaxy evolution. I, I'm, I'm biased because I work on uh, galaxy simulations. This is uh, work done by one of our colleagues here that a number of people are graduate students that are working with him. I work with him. His name's Phil Hopkins. He's a, a professor here. And this is a, a zoom in on a simulation of, a, of an individual galaxy that consists of gas and gravity and uh, a number of other effects. And so we can get a somewhat realistic looking galaxy system that we've totally simulated and created on a computer. Um, but it looks a lot like what you'd see when you look at Hubble Space Telescope images of, the, of, of galaxies in the sky. Um, what's more, we can uh, simulate how supernovae occur. This is a simulation done, a hydrodynamic simulation done, of the moment at which a supernova, a type 1a supernova, explodes. And you can see this is the uh, stellar surface and this is the interior where it's starting to cause this enormous hot jet that's exploding out the side of a supernova. So for those of you who don't know, supernovae are what occur uh, in a variety of circumstances, but, but typically when stars, massive stars, uh, run out of material to, to hold up their interiors so they collapse under their own gravity and then they, they explode in an enormous explosion. And that's essentially what's being modeled here and visualized here. Pretty spectacular stuff. Um, and then finally, uh, we can model a representative volume of the entire universe. We can't represent the entire universe, but we can take a representative chunk of it. In this case, this is, uh, this is one of my simulations. It's 100 megaparsecs on a side, so it's uh, 300 million light years across one of these dimensions, so it's quite a large volume of space. And as you can see, because it's all white in here, 
uh, and everything is basically the same color. It means that in the early universe, and this is only a few million years after the birth of the universe, the, the density of material is pretty uniform. There's not that much difference between uh, you know, this spot and this spot in terms of the mass content. It's, it's all a very uniform, uh, hot uh, volume. But there are slight overdensities which are enhanced by gravity. Remember we were talking about gravity as an attractive force. So if something has a little bit of an overdensity, it has a little bit more mass, it's going to attract this area that has a little bit more mass. And they'll coalesce into a more massive thing. And it turns into a runaway effect. And that's what we see here when we evolve it forward. You see brighter areas tend to be higher density areas and darker areas are lower density areas. So what happens is you get this runaway effect where massive areas get more massive. And so they attract more stuff to them and they get more massive. And you, f you find filaments of material, of higher density material, and where those filaments coalesce, you find knots of material. And those knots are where galaxies form and clusters of galaxies form because that's where the overdensity of material is. And in between those filaments and in between those walls of matter are these voids that are devoid of a lot of stuff, including galaxies and stars and that sort of thing. And we run these simulations and they reproduce the overall distribution of matter that we see when we look up in the sky. When you see the sky, uh, when, when, you, when you catalog where galaxies are located, they are not located just uniformly across the sky. You'll find them uh, in filaments and walls like we can reproduce in simulations. Okay, so what do we simulate? All astrophysical systems that we can get our hands on, planets, stars, galaxies, and the universe. And finally, on what computers do we run our simulations? Well, as I was saying before, uh, the simulations that I did simplistically for, for this talk were just done on my laptop. I mean, you can do decent simulations on your, on your own laptop and still make progress, but for the most part, we want to run the highest level simulations that we can on the highest power computers that we can, which is to say on supercomputers. So, have you guys all seen The Martian? There is a... Oh, what the heck is this? I was watching it before. Let's hope it works. Oh, no! Thwarted. Okay, well, there's a scene in The Martian. <laughs> I'll just describe it to you. There's a scene where a character, and I don't think I'm ruining too much about the film with this, a character goes to a supercomputer and he plugs his computer directly into the supercomputer <laughs> and, uh, and then does his calculations and then at the end it says, calculations correct. <laughs> this does not happen. And you don't need to go to a supercomputer in order to use it. Just like any res com computational resource in this day and age, you can connect to it over the internet. You can do your stuff over the internet. Um, this is, uh, the computer that they use in that uh, movie is a real NASA computer. It's called Pleiades. Um, this is a very similar machine that I use. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. It's called Blue Waters. It exists in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. This is the building that houses it. It is such an expensive piece of infrastructure that they have built it to withstand a plane crashing into that building and bombs exploding. It is a very secure site because it's worth a lot of money. And it's a lot of, uh, it, it's a lot of our infrastructure in, in, in computational science, not just astrophysics, but all computational sciences. It consists of rows of these towers that just house computers that are running all the time. Uh, in this particular system, there are 360,000 processors that you can access and run your, your computer code on. Um, and as you might guess, they don't give access to everyone. You have to apply for time because it's extremely expensive. You apply for time, and then they might give you some amount of time on this machine to be able to run whatever, uh, whatever code that you think that you, you can run to answer a particular science question. And because I promised to to do some work on a supercomputer. Hopefully, I'm not thwarted on this front as well. Okay, so uh, in much the same way that you connect to anything 
on the internet you connect in this particular case I'm connecting via SSH which is a secure manner of connecting you have to use this little RSA key which is like on your your um, your phone where it does the authenticator and make sure two two point authentication is working so I SSH into blue waters I have to enter my password along with this the number that's on this thing Live demos are always a mistake. Oh, yeah, they are always a mistake. <laughs> I'm just going to turn on the light so I can read this thing. Okay. Okay, I'm almost done here. Hopefully my password will be accepted. Hooray! Okay, so... And basically what you do on... Uh, when you log in is you have your computer, you install your software that you might need. Generally, software that we use is all written by scientists in general, so I'm one of the authors of the software that I, that I run. Um, you submit a job to the computer to run on its own time through a, a queue. In this case, I'm asking for one, 24 hours on 512 processors, and I do that. Q sub submit. Oh, job submitted. And then you wait like three days for it to go through the queue <laughs> and it runs your code and then you try and analyze it. So it's not very interesting and certainly uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't end when you're finished. It doesn't give you calculations <laughs> correct <laughs> as it does in the Martian, but this is basically the nature of the game. So on what computers do we run our simulations? Taxpayer-supported supercomputers run by NASA or the National Science Foundation or the Department of Energy. And uh, in general, conclusions of this talk, why do we use simulations? To run virtual experiments on our computer. How do we actually do it? By approximating s solutions to physical equations um, and discret discretizing some variable, in this case time. What do we simulate? Basically all astrophysical systems that we can get our hands on. And on what computers do we run our simulations? Uh, Taxpayer-supported supercomputers. So thank you, taxpayers. Please con continue to support science funding agencies. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And I realize I've gone a couple minutes over. Uh, I, I'm happy to take questions for... A, a few questions, and then I'll, I'll let everybody go. And then if you want to ask more questions, you can come bother me after. So um, first question, you were very eager. Okay. Um, because I fast, I have to, uh, I'll just ask a different one so other people have a chance. Yeah. Um, just one. Just one question. I'll send you the code. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's not special. It's just code. <laughs> uh, next question. I'm sorry for keeping you waiting. Um, so that simulation, um, was it our sun or was it just um, another sun? The simulation, which simulation? The one that I did of the, of the Earth orbiting around it? What's that? Supernova. Oh, the supernova. It's not our sun. Our sun is not mass en massive enough to turn into a supernova, yeah, or to turn into a black hole. It, it was just, uh, usually what's done in these simulations is we're not, unlike the case where there was the simulation of the Milky Way in Andromeda, for the most part we're trying to simulate a generic type of a system. So that wasn't a specific supernova like that one over there or that one over there. It was, it was just trying to model a generic supernova that tends to be typical of supernovae. But good question. In the middle. So, what many properties about galaxies can we, or what properties of, what properties of galaxies can we predict with these simulations? What properties of galaxies can we predict without looking at their colors? It sounds like you can tell the age of the stars by the color and everything. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you can tell about galaxies based on their color, and there are a few people here who focus on that sort of thing in the audience. Um, for the most part, color can tell you about the age of the, of the stars that are present. It can tell you about the content in those stars. What, that's to say what, uh, what elements are present and burning in the stars or on the surface of the stars because there are different metals and things that can be, aside from just hydrogen and helium, that make up the bulk of the content of stars. There are other metals that are present. Um, it also can tell you about 
how much material, like dust material, that might be around that galaxy or in, or in between the galaxy and us. And in the same way, this is easy to understand. If you think about uh, on a dusty day in the desert, there might be a dust storm that's covering up the sun. But if you can see the sun through it, it might look very red, right? Because the dust is scattering all the blue light out of it. It's the same thing with astrophysical systems. There might be a lot of dust in the outskirts of the galaxy that's the light being emitted might actually be blue, but as it travels through that dusty material, the blue light is scattered away, and the only light that gets to us is red. So these are at least three things that we can tell based on the colors of galaxies. One more question, and then, and then uh, I'll take more questions on my own over here. Yes? So you can do that, that. You're right that if you're dealing with more than two bodies, you, it cannot be solved just with pencil and paper. You need to employ some sort of simulation, typically done on a computer, although in the early days it was, just, it was, it was like running one of these simulations where you did all the calculations. But um, in the cases of, it, it's the same way that I demonstrated for three or more bodies. Essentially, when you're calculating the gravitational acceleration that one body feels, you figure out what its acceleration is from b body A, the first body, and it's pulling you this way, and then you, gravity is an additive force. And so you might feel additional gravitational acceleration from this body over here. You just, the net acceleration that you feel is the superposition of the two, the two forces. So um, I'm being pulled by this chair, and I'm being pulled by this table, in the absence of the table, I'd just go straight towards the chair. In the absence of the chair, I'd go straight towards the table. But because both of them are pulling me, I'm pulled somewhere in between them. The gravitational pull on me is the combination of the gravitational pull of both of those objects. And the same goes for multi-multi-star systems or multi-object systems. If there are, I'm being pulled by each of the 120 of you, uh, I'm pulled a little here, a little here, but the net force, the net acceleration that I feel is basically from the center of mass of the entire system. So I'm pulled in the general direction of everyone. Is that... Now you focus on the... Not on, so you, what you focus now in all the system is the only one star to... Uh, if, if you have any both different stars and just to move, simulate the one star um, directly by other forces, other stars and forces, it's not a system, right? No, you can do it as stepping through each individual acceleration and then adding them all up in the same way that I demonstrated before. You're just stepping through and get calculating the acceleration from body one, body two, body three, body four, body four, and stepping through each individual mass and calculating the acceleration. That's how it was done initially. There are higher level algorithms that simplify that and make it faster, but at the base level, that's the correct way of doing it. Um, okay, so I promise that's the end. Uh, so, quick message about outside. As I mentioned, there are alternative routes to get out on the field. Right now, we are in the lecture hall. Um, you want to go out of the lecture hall, turn left. Erica will be your guide if you're traveling out there immediately. Um, travel out, go to the left make another left, and the telescopes will be on the field. But as I said before, we will continue to have a question and answer panel by resident specialists on a variety of topics here until 10 o'clock, and the observing will go until 10 o'clock. So you're free to go back and forth. The doors will remain unlocked. And uh, thank you for coming. Come back. Okay, thank you for being patient, everyone. So the, the Q&A panel is about to begin, and I will take my rabble of question askers outside so we won't disturb you guys. Uh, and oh, I guess I should introduce you guys first. Sit down, man. Uh, our, oh, nice flashy uh, lights. Our 
First panelist is Abby, Dr. Abby Kreitz, who's a postdoc here. She gave a talk earlier in the, in the semester, and she is specifically, they'll all address whatever scientific questions you have to the best of their knowledge, but the, the focuses of her knowledge are based on cryogenics, the cosmic microwave background, and cosmology, the nature of the universe. Matt Orr is a graduate student here, uh, and he knows about planet formation, galaxy, human space flight, and space travel. And finally, Robin is a new postdoc, just started here two days ago, from, came from Columbia University, and uh, her science is the Milky Way, simulations, galactic archaeology, and dark matter. So, I leave it to them. It's bad for me. We'll just go outside. So I'm Anybody have any questions? Yeah. You know that um, people, let's say a hundred years ago, would have great difficulty imagining the world that we live in today and the scientific accomplishments that we have. In terms of, of space travel, I'm having a difficult time conceptualizing how. Um, human beings in some distant future would be able to accomplish in any significant way space travel to, let's say, an Earth-like exoplanet that could be 100,000 light years away or, or even further. I'm, I'm having difficulty seeing how the technology could advance in terms of um, human beings able to survive in, in a um, space environment. Uh, I know there's, uh, you know, cryogenics in terms of, you know, putting uh, people into some sort of comatose, you know, situation so that they're not ex experiencing that extreme boredom or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, how, how would you address that? Because I know that there's this ongoing research that's going on to accomplish just that. Well, not only is there, uh, I would say, a significant number of people working on space flight and ways that human space flight can advance, but um, a great number of far more imaginative people than myself have contributed to a great body of work in science fiction about how people might go about you know, getting to Alpha Centauri or some of the other nearby star systems. Um, and generally, until we actually, you know, perhaps figure out if there's ways that you can go very, very close to the speed of light without uh, killing everyone on a spaceship, um, frankly, no one's going to get anywhere very fast. And so, one of the big ideas that you could send people to another star system is that you build a ship that can last for hundreds of generations or tens of thousands of years where you put you know, a small city on the ship of people who have all volunteered to get on a ship and go to the stars. And um, they and their children and their children's children and so on and so forth all just live on this ship until the ship finally shows up somewhere. And uh, then none of the people on board were the people that got on. And there's all sorts of ethical questions about that. But uh, at least right now, that's the best idea we've got uh, is a generation ship, so to speak. But um, it's actually amazing given, um, I guess, relativity. If you were to sit on a spaceship and accelerate at, um, I think I did this problem, yeah, like at 1G towards the center of the Milky Way. Um, although from Earth, it might take you uh, a couple, I think it's 23,000 centuries for the ship to get to the center of the Milky Way. Uh, the people on the ship would only experience um, like five or 600 years getting there. So um, that's thanks to relativity and time dilation and how things get weird when you get close to the speed of light. But um, of course, uh, none of those people would still probably survive since it's still a couple hundred years of experience there. But frankly, um, human space flight is hard and we still haven't made it past, well, not very much past the moon. So uh, we have a long way to go. But there's lots of great science fiction that I read in my free time. Uh, other questions?
There, there is a theoretical um, spaceship drive called the Alp Curie drive, which is more or less exactly what you're describing. Um, uh, the problem with it is it would kill everything in a straight line before and uh, after it, because the way that you would distort space-time would require the mass of Jupiter in antimatter, and as the ship either comes into the bubble that it would then shoot through space in, or comes out of it, it would then annihilate a uh, Jupiter mass of antimatter in like a laser beam, and it would destroy just about everything uh, there. And of course, no one knows how to make this kind of matter. This, well, it's antimatter with uh, negative space-time curvature, so no one knows how to make it, but it's a fun mathematical thing that would uh, be a Bond villain super weapon, like a Bond villain super weapon, like fever dream, basically. I think more generally, one of the big blocks to this sort of manipulation is, right, we're real good at manipulating electric and magnetic fields, right? We know how light works, we know how to break it up, we know how to do, like, radio signaling and all this stuff. And that's because we have a really good working theory for, essentially, quantum mechanics. Um, we, we understand how that works really well. We don't understand how gravity works in the same way. Um, and we can't reconcile those two things together at this point. Um, and so a lot of the power that we have over, over things like radio waves or light or electric fields or magnetic fields, if, if we had a, a similar kind of control and understanding of what gravity is, then I think there would be some possibilities along those lines. Um, but right now we just don't understand how it fits in with the rest of the forces we know about. And that's a big impediment to th that sort of like manipulation because our understanding of gravity just hasn't caught up with the rest of the forces that we know about. What kind of experiments are being conducted right now to further understand gravity at this moment that you're interested in? Um, that, I, that like we collectively are interested in? Yeah. Um, I guess, well, like cosmology and the CMB. Um, uh, LIGO, the recent observ observations of black holes colliding and giving out uh, effectively sound waves through space-time. Um, there are people measuring the, um, if you remember perhaps from uh, your physics class in high school uh, or maybe college, um, in the force of gravity there's big G, which is Newton's constant, which describes how strong gravity is. There are people on Earth trying to measure uh, that big G with very delicate um, and elaborate experiments that are, well, we only know big G to like three uh, numbers, so it's like 6.67, and then after that we don't really know. And um, compared to just about every other physical constant we know, that's, we don't understand it at all. Um, and again... I mean, we know, we know, like, well, before we turned it into a, a fixed constant, people got the speed of light for, like, what, 15 decimal places or something? So compared to that, we know, like, we, it's very hard to measure this with gravitational constant. And okay. it's getting better now because people are starting to use atomic power. I mean, a big part of it's that gravity is so weak compared to electromagnetism, and so it's uh, 10 to the 40 times weaker. Am I correct? Uh, I don't know. It's a lot weaker. So you need a lot more stuff to make the same amount of force that you could get with, you know, the battery in your phone, for instance. But you can talk more about like cosmology and gravity. Yeah. So um, one thing that people are trying to do is kind of understand those fundamental forces in like the very, very early universe. And um, one of the things that we use is the cosmic micro background radiation. So it's basically um, kind of sometimes it's thought of as like the baby picture of the universe because it's like what the universe was like right after the Big Bang. And um, basically the forces that happen like 10 to the minus 34 seconds after the Big Bang, so like, you know, point. 34 zeros and a one after the Big Bang in seconds um, <laughs> is what we're actually trying to measure by measuring that uh, radiation. And that radiation comes was emitted uh, much later than that by those timescales, like 300,000 years after the Big Bang. But because the universe was expanding at such a rapid rate at that time, it was actually like kind of stretching and pulling the universe and imprinting a signal from that early time in the cosmic micro background. So we're actually building a lot of instruments to measure that Oh yeah, and also it's a really, really tiny signal <laughs> as well. So we're, measure, we're making a lot of instruments that can measure the cosmic micro background to increasing, increasing, increasing precision to really like tease out these things about the very, very early universe. Because, you know, we actually can't get light from that time because the earliest light we can measure is 300,000 years after the Big Bang. We can't actually measure light 
you know, 10 to the minus 34 seconds after the Big Bang, but we can measure like its imprint on that. So yeah, that's another way. So that's the signal that, that Abby's talking about. And we think that it might have something to do with a how gravity works and that maybe it worked a little differently in the early, early, early universe. And that maybe if we can get some clues about that from the CMB, we might understand something more about gravity. Um, but if you ask like 10 like gravity theorists about what that might be, you'll get like, a hundred theories because we have no data to constrain any of them basically at this point or very little anyway. Yeah, we've got to like measuring like the only thing you can measure <laughs> about that basically to yeah. get like the tiniest handle on it. But yeah, there's just there's a lot of theories that and not that many measurements. But yeah. Yeah, so any other questions? Yeah. So I have kind of a simulation question. Uh, what's the uh, probably the most uh, most complicated or most realistic like astrophysical system that you've been able to um, uh, validate. So is there ever been an astrophysical event that um, uh, you, you were able to simulate and then actually observe, or are the time scales just, have they always been just too long? No, they're not always too long. So a really good example of that is actually the black holes that LIGO detected. So they, and in fact, what they had to do in order to detect those was basically to run a whole lot of simulations where two black holes hit each other with different initial conditions, right? And different, like, two, two black holes with two different masses or whatever. And they just picked a whole bunch of different types of systems and ran all of them and looked at and calculated what the gravitational waves would look like coming from all these different systems. And then they could search through their data for that particular signal and then when they found one, they, they knew from that signal what, si which simulation matched it the best. And that's essentially how, with, with some variations, is how they do that detection. Um, and so then, then you can refine that process. Um, but one of the coolest things about that signal was they didn't actually have to make a very sophisticated simulation in order to match the data. And so I, I think that's a really beautiful example that happened recently. Um, and you can get, you can make very, very complicated simulations, with lots of different physical effects in them. Um, but the, the cleanest validations of simulations often are the systems where you only have to get the very basic details right, and then you get the primary, like, features of the system are already in place. It's, it's nice when it works out that way. Oh, yeah, supernovae are yeah. Just a disclaimer, none of us actually work on LIGO. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, the supernova simulation he showed. I mean, you don't often have a supernova so close by that <laughs> you get to see those kinds of details. Not really ever. But, you know, there's like, you know, um, but you do get to kind of take a simulation like that and calculate what kind of, you know, light you would see from such a supernova if it were far away and like what the spectrum, like so what it looks like as a function of frequency. And you can kind of start to kind of feedback on your simulations and like say, you know, we try, we reproduce this, like they call it a light curve, so it's like what the light does as a function of time after the supernova explosion and what its frequency is. And then, you know, you can compare that to your simulations. You can compare your simulations to like a bunch of real supernova that you see in our universe and like that. Those are like, those are just examples of astrophysical phenomenon that happen on fast enough time scales that you can really compare them. So, you know, like the galaxy simulations, those obviously happen on, you know, billions and billions of years time scales, so. There's another really cool example. Um, well, every time they do one of these uh, planetary exploration things with a probe like Juno, essentially in order to figure out how to get it to where it needs to go, you have to do that kind of a valid, like, kind of a simulation. So like Cameron showed you a real simple example there, but they had to, to do that and account not only for like Earth's gravity and the suns and, and Jupiter's, but also like the little kicks that all the other planets will give it and all this other stuff that's out there. Um, and so actually, like, maybe one of the coolest validations is the fact that they, they said, okay, well, Juno will show up there and get in orbit on July 4th at this time, and they had this big media event, and then it actually, like, showed up there at the right time, and, and like, and then they knew, okay, well, then once it gets to Jupiter, we have to fire the rocket at this angle for this long, and that'll put it in orbit around the planet so that it has the right velocity to do that. And then they did that. And that all came from a simulation of what that flight was going to look like. 
Uh, the coolest fact about that is it arrived within one second of their predicted time, and there's about took about five years, and so there were uh, there's about 30 million seconds in a year, so that's um, 150 million seconds. So they got it to one better than you know one in 150 million. So uh, the people up the hill are doing uh, uh, a really good job. So that's a very active area of basically simulations at this point in time. Um, we can understand things like a Earth-like body hitting another Earth-like body and forming the Earth-Moon system. There are simulations that have, supercomputers have the ability to do things like that. It's uh, much harder and only now just barely happening that we can run simulations where you simulate an entire baby solar system where you have enough uh, resolution and particles that you can actually see protoplanets coming together and forming and making planets. Um, and it's such a, I guess, a theoretical hurdle right now because we understand how you can make snowball-sized objects in solar systems, but not a lot of people know how you jump the gap from snowball-sized things to things the size of the moon or, you know, some of the moons around other planets because um, once you get to about snowball-sized things, it seems, at least right now, in the laboratories and things that we see when objects hit each other in, like, protoplanetary disks and baby solar systems, that instead of sticking together anymore, instead they just explode and make a bunch of smaller things. And so... Uh, a lot of people are having issues figuring out how we jump this gap. And so um, that's a very active area of research. Lots of people think that gravity itself is helping just gravity wins at the end of the day, even though they hit and explode, that those things just come back together because there's enough stuff in the solar system um, from these baby solar systems. So, yeah. I have to offer a disclaimer here that I actually, so simulating galaxy formation, and Cameron can back me up on this, I don't think there's a consensus on whether we can do it right yet. It's a really active area of research, too. And <laughs> Cameron's going to yell at me, but... No, that's fair. <laughs> but basically, the, the thing is, like, we can kind of make, if we, like, set it up right, we can kind of make a galaxy that looks like a galaxy that you would see in the universe. The, the sticking point, from my, in my opinion right now, is that what you really want to do is start at the beginning with the what you observed the universe to be like in the cosmic microwave background at 300,000 years after the Big Bang and see if you can put in all, this, all the physics and end up running your simulation for it to today and seeing a galaxy that looks like the Milky Way in their simulation, right? And that's a, that's a, t a, a, a test that we haven't passed yet because it takes an enormous... Uh, you have to account for, for physical processes that happen on an enormous range of like size scales and time scales. And you, can, you have to make a choice when you do your simulation, sort of, and this is what people call like the resolution of the simulation. So you, can, you have to pick a time resolution, like Cameron was talking about, you, you pick a time step at which you like reevaluate all the stuff that you need to for your simulation, right? And if you, once you set that, right, you're ignoring anything that takes less time than that to happen in your simulation. You just won't see it because it didn't, you don't resolve it, essentially, right? like pixelating time. And the same goes for spatial resolution in your simulation. You have to choose whether you want to like try to simulate an enormous box that represents lots of galaxies or whatever forming, or if you want to focus down on one galaxy. And you have to trade off whether you resolve like, you know, the individual supernovae that happen in the galaxy, which happen at the scale of one star, right? And the galaxy is zillions of times larger than that. Um, but, but when that supernova goes off, right, it, it emits this big blast wave, and that changes the, the distribution of the stuff in your galaxy over a much larger scale than the star is. And so processes that happen at small scales can feed back to larger scales, and if you don't resolve the, the right small scale, you have to do something about that. So you have all these choices and trade-offs that you have to make when you do one of these simulations. And, and galaxy formation is one of those places where we're still fighting with which trade-offs we can get away with making and all this other stuff very, very actively like going on in this department right now today 
I had conversations about this with people. <laughs> and so, so that's a really active area of research. So when you, when you say, yeah, we can kind of simulate a galaxy, it depends on really what you want to know. And a lot of the big questions about our universe now on the scale of galaxies have to do with how the matter that we can see and the matter that we can't see, like the dark matter, are related to one another. How the dark matter shapes the formation of galaxies. How, how looking at the, the stars and galaxies can tell us where the dark matter is and all these things. And we know that all that stuff was bound together by the, by the initial conditions that, that Abby is looking at. But we don't know how you get from exactly from point A at, at the Big Bang to like the Milky Way galaxy today and then beyond that to like our solar system and the Earth, right? So you have this many leveled thing where you try to b break this up into different pieces, but depending on which piece you're studying, you might, you, we still get some different answers that we have to reconcile together. So, depressing but true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cameron fled. Um, so I personally, my favorite thing that I recently learned from looking at simulations. That you, that you personally simulate? So what I do more has to do with trying. So, so the way in which I work with simulations is not to to run them, but I have ideas about things that we could do with observations in real life, and sometimes we don't have those observations yet, so I test them out with the simulations instead. Right, because then you can, you know, analyze this control experiment, sort of. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is that in the history of the Milky Way, it's eaten a whole bunch of other galaxies, right? So there are a lot of, a lot of like, smaller galaxies that came in. You can see some of them that are in the process of coming in if you go to the Southern Hemisphere and you look at the Magellanic Clouds. Those haven't get gotten eaten yet, but they're going to get eaten. Um, and so one of the big questions in in sort of understanding the history of the Milky Way is like what happened to all of these? Like they were made of stars too. Those stars are somewhere in the galaxy now. Like what happened to them? And what were all these, like what were all those little galaxies like? Because they were all smaller than the Milky Way. And so we don't know whether they're just like mini Milky Ways or there's something else or whatever. And so in principle, you would want to be able to like dig these out. And that's what people call galactic archaeology. Um, and like reassemble the, like find the stars that are all in one thing and that, that got eaten and figure out what that thing looked like before it got eaten. It's sort of a window into the past um, by using stuff that we can, that's relatively close up to us instead of trying to go and find these things out in the rest of space. Um, anyway, so the neatest thing that I learned from simulations is, is a way to, to possibly do that by observing the orbits of the stars. Um, and looking at the or orbits together with the different amounts of different elements that you see in different stars, or their chemical fingerprint. And you can take those two th pieces of information together and match up, in principle, if you have good enough observations, match up the stars that maybe came in from some alien galaxy into our Milky Way at some point in the past and figure out what that thing looked like. So that's, that, that's really close to the, the research that I'm working on right now, but that's something that I didn't have a good illustration for until a simulation like made that apparent um, and that's like how I've been trying to demonstrate that process and so so like people kind of had the idea that you could do this but then to really show it with a simulation is something that's happened very recently. Do you guys want to answer this question? I guess the coolest thing I've learned I've I'm sort of new to all this as a grad student is uh, I've looked at uh, galaxy simulations, which uh, we would argue do a really good job yeah. making galaxies, but that's my boss talking more than me. Um, I think they look cool. But anyways, uh, is asking, do galaxies get uh, dense and make stars? Uh, do they get dense and then break up into little pockets and clouds and make stars? Or do they start breaking up into clouds first that then become dense and make stars? And um, that's sort of an esoteric argument, but it's, it depends, it really, it, uh, it affects what we see out there in the shapes of galaxies and their outskirts um, sort of very subtly. And as 
a grad student. This is a thing that I've discovered myself, and I think it looks, it's really neat. And so that's the neatest thing I've ever discovered about uh, the universe using simulations. And it appears that galaxies break up and then become dense. Um, at least uh, simulations seem to suggest this. But <laughs> In a couple months, there will be a paper that you could read in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomy Society. But, yeah, so scientifically discovered. Um, let's see. Okay, so I build things. Um, <laughs> so, but one thing that we actually use simulations for is to kind of try to understand the signals that we're going to be measuring for, from our instruments. So when we're making instruments, um, we're actually working on a new instrument right now that's trying to measure signals from galaxies that are, bas that are basically one billion years after the Big Bang. So the universe is 13 point whatever billion years old. Um, so we're trying to measure signals from galaxies like very, very far away. And those are actually kind of hard to measure. And they're actually really hard to simulate as well. So we don't actually have a lot of good simulations or a lot of good measurements for what we're going to see from these galaxies. But uh, one of the things that we kind of use both to justify why we want to make these instruments is to, you know, say like we actually don't have a lot of information from simulation. So what we want to do actually is make measurements and then kind of give that information to the people that are doing the simulations and kind of do some feedback in that way. But also kind of just to show that you're going to build an instrument that is going to show something useful. What we do is like we look at the simulations that we do have and we say like what level of the signal do you think it's going to be? And like our instrument has some ability to measure very faint signals, but you know if the simulation says it's going to be up here and it's really down here, then that's actually like pretty challenging for our instruments. But it's also something that you learn. You know if you don't if you say my instrument could measure it if it were here, but we haven't seen anything, then that means that the signal has to be lower. So we kind of like feedback with simulations even as instrumentalists and observers. And I think that happens kind of across. Astronomy? Yeah. There's a so I work on something that's called millimeter wavelength instruments, and they're called that because the wavelength of light that we're trying to measure is like about a few millimeters. And um, they're pretty similar to what you think of when you think of like a typical camera, except because they're measuring uh, much lower energy, much longer wavelength of light, they're actually much bigger. So, you know, they're they have a lot less pixels than you have in this teeny tiny camera, but the focal plane itself, which is like the pixels, is like this big. So all the light collecting area is basically, you know, as big as my arms right here. And there's like about a thousand pixels in that. And then you kind of build a big box around it, which is like the body of the camera in the same way that, you know, you have the camera body for a normal camera, except a lot of that is kind of specialized. Uh, mechanical and electrical engineering to read out the signals into your computer and also because of, I mentioned that the signals we're trying to measure are very, very small. Um, if you had a camera that was actually at room temperature, like our normal cameras, the sensors themselves would actually have a larger signal than the signal you're trying to measure. So the reason cryogenics is one of my like areas of expertise is that we actually take these cameras and like the pixels, which are the light absorbing elements, and we actually cool them down to a quarter of a degree above absolute zero. And we do that with a lot of uh, different complicated helium refrigerators. So um, liquid helium is actually four degrees above absolute zero. And there's a special isotope of helium, helium-3, which um, is even colder when it's liquid. And we actually use uh, those liquids in refrigerators to cool our detectors. So the whole inside of the camera is incredibly cold, colder than the universe, basically, um, because we want to be able to measure the universe. Um, and then it's kind of in these like concentric shells that get warmer and warmer and we have kind of like special legs that are you know very very strong but not very thermally conductive so you don't heat up the inside of your sensor and all of that's under vacuum so we use a pump to get all the air out so that the air doesn't actually take the heat from the outside of the instrument to the detectors themselves so there's a lot of kind of a background work that goes into getting the sensors really cold and then we use those we basically take them to a telescope and then we install the camera on the telescope, and that's how we make our measurements. But like, what is that part of the instrument building process? Do you, do you have to have like engineering? 
Um, I kind of consider myself like a bad mechanical engineer, a bad electrical engineer. <laughs> like, <I'm laughs> basically, I do all of those things, but like, I didn't go to school for any of them. I, I went to school for physics, so I took quantum mechanics, and like, electrical engineering was kind of like a thing that I learned on the job, you know. So it's a lot of uh, kind of learning things as you go, and you know, learning from people that have come before you. So, but yeah, I mean, I do design work, so I work. I like design the mechanical parts of the thing on the computer and then we fabricate them at a shop that, you know, we send them out and they send them to us and we assemble them and, you know, we solder things, <laughs> you know, so like we do the electrical design and then build it and, you know, test it. So it takes about three years to make a camera from like the very beginning to the end. And then, so one of the cool things is that um, I've been to the South Pole three times because uh, one of the telescopes that I work on is at the South Pole. So we spent like three years in the north here in the US building the camera and then at the end we actually took it to the South Pole. So, yeah. Yeah, so I have an undergraduate degree in physics and then I have a PhD in uh, astrophysics. So I think it can kind of go, I mean some people in my field have a PhD in physics instead of astrophysics, like because we do kind of like hands-on stuff, like it kind of falls between astronomy and physics, so either one is fine. And then as far as undergrad degrees, I think like it could be either astronomy or physics. And I even know some people that were like electrical engineers <laughs> in undergrad and then they did degrees in physics. So, yeah. Although you don't necessarily need a physics degree uh, from undergrad. I know a friend who's here who did piano performance. Oh, he, he studied a lot of physics in between coming to grad, before coming to grad school, but <laughs> he's really good at the piano. Who would have thought? More questions? Um, they're called transition edge sensors, and the way they work is that they're basically superconductors, and um, so they're a special metal. Sometimes they're like a metal that just naturally becomes superconducting at low temperatures, so some metals just naturally, if you get them below like one Kelvin, they become a superconductor, which, you know, means that current goes through them with, uh, like, basically have infinitely low resistance. Um, and if you, or you can just kind of make combinations of different metals that have a very specific transition temperature. And then the way it actually, oh, there's chalk. Um, <laughs> so the reason we use them is that um, if you have temperature here, the temperature of your sensor, and we'll say this is like 0.5 Kelvin, so like half a degree above absolute zero, and then you have the resistance of the sensor up here. So over here, it's just like a normal resistance, like one ohm. <laughs> And then as it gets close to the, what we call the transition temperature, it actually just like goes down in resistance crazily, crazily fast. And then like, you know, then it goes to, you know, zero-ish, <laughs> basically. Um, and what we do is like if you have, if the sensor's here, then, you know, it has no resistance and, you know, that's not that helpful. And if you have it up here, it's just a normal resistor. But we actually kind of use current to hold it exactly in the middle of the transition. And what we're measuring from the sky is actually the light hitting the sensor and warming it up and cooling it down because there's some power in that, those photons that are hitting your detector. So those photons are causing a teeny tiny change in temperature. And what you can see here is that that causes a huge change in resistance. And that actually allows you to measure teeny tiny changes in temperature in a huge change in resistance. So if you just had a normal sensor, it would look something like this. So it would just be temperature versus resistance and a you know, teeny change in <laughs> temperature would just cause a you know, medium change in resistance and you wouldn't have a super sensitive thermometer. So that's one way that we do it. There's a lot of different uh, technologies, but for the millimeter wavelength, this is like one of the more common ones. Like, yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same concept. Yeah, like, I don't know exactly how you use it, but basically if you think of, you know, basically like the, uh, like this temperature is kind of telling you like the, like, brightness of that spectrum kind of and like what that looks like. So I think, I think it's the same. I don't know. Do you guys? Yeah, 
like the sun is 6,000. I mean, hotter things give off more light, so the sun is giving off a tremendous number of photons, but something that's half a degree Kelvin or fractions of a degree Kelvin are giving off, you know, individual photons. You can give them names if you wanted to. And there's, I mean, there's jokes for the people here who do gamma ray and X-ray astronomy. It's because they have so few photons that um, X-ray ones, they, get to, they can count them, but gamma ray ones give them names. That's a bad joke, but... <laughs> You don't get very many of them from something like the sun. Like the cosmic microwave background is the temperature of the black body that she was talking about is three Kelvin as opposed to like the sun, which is like six thousand. So yeah. Incidentally, because the cosmic microwave background is everywhere in space, that's as cold as you can make anything by just, you know, leaving it out on your porch, if you will. Um, <laughs> well, your cosmic porch, because uh, everything else, that's the coldest thing in the universe without having to actually do some work, like put it in one of their fancy refrigerators. Um, otherwise, everything is warmer. You know, the sun is warmer, this room's a lot warmer, um, but yeah. I think that 50 degrees is 50 degrees Fahrenheit is cold, but that's like 250 Kelvin. So, yeah, or no, it's like 270 I mean, Kelvin. It's, it's hardly like, it's bigger than Fahrenheit degrees. like two Fahrenheit degrees. Yeah. 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 It's really, really cold at the South Pole once, and someone put a thermometer outside. Yeah. yeah. I think someone looked at the Earth once with a satellite and saw, like, a little bit colder than that, but no one was there with a thermometer, so they don't accept that as the coldest. <laughs> um, so it's sort of a... The satellite said, ah, I don't believe you, but, yeah. Um, other question? Well, <laughs> that's kind of an ambitious <laughs> statement. <laughs> ah, okay. So what do we know? Oh my gosh, very little. Um, so the most interesting, like, dark matter-related stuff that I know about has to do with like people who are. Well, yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll go this way with it. So there are. People that are trying to, like, they think that dark matter is actually a particle, like a, an electron or a, actually it's closer to a neutron. Um, something that you could, like, build a big detector, like, like at an accelerator or somewhere and try to, like, see one hit it and record some signal that tells you that it happened. Um, so there are a few strategies that people have put up, like, come up with for doing this. One is happening at the LHC. Right, which is this thing that collides 
you know, heavy, heavy ions together or something, and, and all kinds of crap spatters out of there, and then they have, it's like covered in like 360 degrees 4 pi with, with detectors, and they try to catch as much of the crap that comes out as possible and then classify it. Um, and so one of the things that people are looking at at the LHC is whether they can, f whether there's like unaccounted for gaps in uh, like adding up all the crap that comes out of each of these things, right? Because like if you, if you take all of, yeah, <laughs> boom. So, so if, you, if you were to like detect all the things that came out of the collision and then you like add up all the energy and mass that came there and you like, you should come up with what you started with. And so basically one of the ways they're trying to figure out is to like actually, if you could make dark matter in these collisions, it would, because we know that it doesn't interact with basically anything ever, it would pass right through all these detectors and you wouldn't account for all of that mass. And so then, so there's a, there are people that are essentially looking for this missing stuff in these and, and seeing whether they can find some particle that looks like it could be the dark matter. Because we have some ideas about what the characteristics of that particle are, and so you can see, okay, well, maybe, maybe we can find it that way. So there's groups that are trying to make some in the lab and then figure out that they made it after the fact. Um, and then there's some groups that are trying to just put some big chunks of stuff out there that, and hope that some dark matter that's just hanging out in the universe runs into it. So that's a, the, the key there is just volume. Like all of these detectors are made of stuff that will, it'll like do something when a dark matter particle hits it. Like some of them are transition edge sensor based actually and so it'll, the dark matter particle will heat up the thing a little bit and it'll do the same business and it'll give you a, a signal. Or it, there's some where it'll make like a, it should make like a flash of light if it does this. And usually in order to tell that it was not some other kind of particle, you have like several different signals at the same time going on so that like only if they all happen right, then you know it wasn't like a neutron. Um, but anyway, so the, the, the key there is volume. So these keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so nobody's detected anything yet. <laughs> first of all, but like, like Abby was saying, if you understand how your detector works and you know like how, if, if the dark matter was like this, then we should have seen, you know, three and we don't see any, that puts a limit on the, the characteristics of what the dark matter could be if it's a particle, right? So point of this story is all of these efforts are starting to get to the point now after probably 20 years of work where you can start to actually rule out some things that people took seriously as possible dark matter candidates. Um, and so we're now entering like a really interesting phase where like the next generation of detectors will really make some, put some pressure on the bazillion theories about what dark matter is that are out there. So that's really, I think, a really exciting development that's relatively recent. Um, that's not the one I'm most personally involved with, but I think it's like, really cool that people are trying to go after this. Not everybody even thinks dark matter is a particle like that. There are other theories for what people think it might be that are a little more obscure. Um, but the, the, the one that everybody <laughs> hopes is true because it will solve a lot of problems at once is that it's a particle. And that being said, the fact that we understand almost nothing about dark matter, um, we still put it in all of our galaxy simulations, for oh instance, yeah. and um, <laughs> we just we put yeah we put part we put particles in our simulations that are dark matter particles, which do nothing but sit there and have mass. They feel gravity, but they don't do anything else with any of the other stuff. So like the star particles can explode and give off light, and the gas particles you give them a bunch of rules. They can turn into stars. They get kicked out if you know stars start throwing a whole lot of stuff at them and but the dark matter particles just sit there and... Gravity is still, you said that we know that it doesn't interact with anything? So no, no, nothing no. except by gravity. Only we know that it does is gravity. And that's how we discovered it in the, f well, yeah. that's why we think there's any of it out there in the first place. That's the only possible evidence for it, that it's done. That's the only evidence so far is by its gravitational interaction. And then all these detection um, ways that we think we might be able to detect it are as if it very weakly interacts through some back channel with some of our other forces. Um, but uh, yeah, so we include it in our simulations and remarkably with sort of the basic rules we have for it, 
um, and it's sort of the glue that holds together the sort of the spider web of structure that Cameron had that uh, great little video where you're showing how the universe has all this spider web of structure that galaxies live in the knots of and um, dark matter are just simple rule of it sits there and has gravity and it interacts with all the rest of the universe just by gravity works well enough to give us what you know what we for the most part see out there and there are lots of fun Wikipedia pages that have problems that we have now like the missing satellites problem and the too big to fail problem and things like that that are related to dark matter and the numbers of galaxies we see out there and the small galaxies around galaxies like around Milky Way but for the most part it seems that all these problems are problems with how we understand the regular stuff that we see um, and that dark matter for the most part goes along for the ride and our model works well, sort of. And I, I have to comment on this. It's actually really funny because in the case of, you know, like gas and stars and all of that, we, we have lots of information. We know what they're made of mostly and we know like how all of that physics works and everything. But because, in a sense, because we have like virtually no idea what dark matter is, it's real easy to make a simulation of it because you just throw a bunch of particles in there and say, hey, do some gravity and don't do anything else. Um, and so the first big cosmological simulations that tried to reproduce that structure in the universe that Cameron was showing you were just dark matter. But if you look at the structure that it makes and then you, you say, okay, well, every time I see a lump of dark matter, I'll put like a fake galaxy in there. And then you look at the distribution of galaxies and you compare it to what you see, already matches almost like scary well, even though you didn't say anything about how those galaxies got there. Um, so, I, th I think that as we, if we figure out what dark matter is, it may change wh how we do those simulations. <laughs> I have kind of a question for the panel as well. As <laughs> well, I mean, so is it also, I mean, it's also true that if you tried to do those simulations without dark matter, like, they wouldn't work at all, right? Yeah. So, like, we have a lot of evidence for the existence of something that, interacts with gravity <laughs> with all the other stuff because like you couldn't really make that web simulation work without dark matter, right? Yeah, and it's because you need to give the galaxies a head start at getting themselves organized. So basically there's, yeah. there's just not enough stuff to pull all the other stuff together, yeah. enough, like, stuff to yeah. the other stuff together yeah. quick enough. Like it would work. It would just take, you know, five times, ten times as long as we know the universe is old. Yeah, and so what happens in, in, in the sketch is that the dark matter doesn't have One of the things is we didn't know that though necessarily until the early 90s when we actually understood the cosmology of the universe a lot better because before it could have been just that the regular matter could have done it and there were a lot of, if you read a lot of cosmology papers from the 80s it's kind of funny because they just have everything wrong. Um, I mean the theory is there and the you know variables are there but they assume oh there's, there's no dark matter, there's no dark energy, it's all just the regular stuff doing it. And so you can write theories that work for the wrong reasons, basically. Now that we have now better, we have better information. thanks to Abby, partly, personally. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not me. It's because of my great background. <laughs> Xenon 10,000. Right. That's the and name of the experiment. Some, so, so the Xenon ones are, and a couple of other species of these are kind of cool because they, um, they have to line them with like lead to keep out other radioactive stuff that's in the signal. And the lead 
itself has to be like not radioactive. And if you just go and dig some lead up out of the ground, it's kind of a little bit radioactive because it's been around the earth. So they use instead lead that was in like Greek ships that sunk to the bottom of the Mediterranean. Cool. And they pull it up yeah. and it's been out of the ground long enough to like had its half-life for most of the rest radioactive stuff that you find in lead. There's a similar thing with steel, <laughs> where a lot of these crazy. things are yeah. made out of steel. And any steel made since 1945 is contaminated with uh, radioactive fallout from nuclear above ground testing. And so all of the steel for these insanely uh, you know, delicate uh, scientific experiments come from the uh, First World War's German Navy that was scuttled um, after the British captured it. Um, and they dredge up pieces of steel and then they re-smelt it in very pristine, careful conditions. And so it all comes thanks to the uh, Treaty of Versailles and armistice, really. <laughs> and all the German general admirals being like, oh, no one's going to get their hands on this ship. We're sinking it. So <laughs> thank a bunch of decisions made in 1917 for Xenon 10,000. Yeah. So yeah, then there's, then there's some others that have like, like solid detectors. And they use, um, so they're made out of like a, like a, a thing that people call simulator. So it's a material that if you knock the atoms in the crystal around, And then, um, and a lot of them, most of them are way, way down on the ground in like old salt mines and stuff. So that you get a way, so, so you actually use the earth to stop a lot of the radiation that would come in the detector from that direction. So only dark matter can get down, because dark matter doesn't interact with just about anything, so only that stuff gets down to your detector. And these are the same way we detect things called neutrinos, which also pass through just about everything. Um, but then you just like, like I said, the, the key is volume. They started with, say, Xenon 10, and that was like 10 gallons, I think. Tons of Xenon yeah. or something. And now they're at like Xenon 10,000, and then that's like, and, and the, the probability that you'll detect a dark matter particle just scales with the volume of the detector, right? You just put out a bigger fly trap and it more flies. So, so that's essentially what people are doing to try and beat down on, on the fact that the, the probabilities of One of the big experimental achievements, I guess for experimental astrophysics, has been like the detection of neutrinos in the last 30 years. Yeah. And um, these things are almost impossible compared to neutrinos. And those were already an impossible technical task. Yeah, where people really didn't think we were ever going to detect neutrinos. Yeah. I mean, one of the first experiments, um, it was like Xenon 10,000, where they left uh, in I think it's Sudbury. There's a big mine up in Idaho, or in, I think it was Idaho, where they first had... Uh, Okay, it was in Canada. <laughs> there was an American there's, one. There's also an American one, yeah, and I forget. It's in some oh, it's the Comstock. No, it's not. Anyways, yeah. there's a big mine in the U.S., and back in the, I think, 80s was the first time they actually were able to discover neutrinos, where deep down in this mine they set out a vat. Well, it was you know, closed. It wasn't just a big you know, kiddie pool full of uh, it was like dry cleaner fluid, I think, because the particular chemical in the dry cleaner fluid, when hit with a neutrino, would interact and make an argon atom because it would knock free an argon atom from this. And so they had this big thing, and off the top of it, there was just a layer of air where the argon would presumably percolate up out of your dry cleaning fluid, and then they would skim it off and through like a mass spectrometer count the number of argon atoms. And they put it down there for like a year. And at the end of the year, they had detected 35 argon atoms or something like that. And from that, in they the, said... In the tank, it was like millions of gallons. Yeah, and they're like, damn, <laughs> we found them. We, f we found them, and yeah, they're there. <laughs> And, um, and based on that information, they thought we didn't understand the sun. Um, this was a whole another problem where they only detected a third of the neutrinos they thought they would detect. So they were really hoping for 100, yeah. but they only got 35. Yeah. And um, it took 30 years for them to figure it out based on theory. And finally, they proved that because neutrinos have some tiny amount of mass, that some of them, they all start out as one kind, then they bleed into three kinds on the way from the sun to the Earth. And so they only see a third of the neutrinos that they expect to see. And a couple of people split $3 million because of that. And they have a nice house somewhere. Well, each of them probably has a nice house. Yeah. Well, they could have pooled it, you know. There's recently, there was a... So, um, recently, the LIGO detections of gravitational waves, there was a 
uh, Russian oligarch who gave a bunch of money to the LIGO scientists and there's like a million dollars each for the sort of the head guys who my money is on to win the Nobel Prize if none of them die before they give it out. Um, well, you can't award it posthumously. Well, that's why they gave that's why they gave Peter Higgs the Nobel when they did because they're really hoping the other people would die before him, so they could just give it to him and two other people. But then they're like, eh, we'll just give it to him and the other people. Yeah. Um, but then they gave a bunch of the junior scientists, uh, everyone who was on the paper discovering the gravitational waves, a thousand dollars, and a bunch of people pooled to together some money to buy a Ferrari. I heard. <laughs> yeah, like 35 of them were like, we're gonna buy a car. So and, yeah. All over. There There's a bunch here. Members here. There are members. So the detectors themselves, one is in Louisiana and the other is in Washington State, like Eastern Washington. By the radiation, the radioactive waste dump yeah, it's up there. Yeah, it's used to be a, a radioactive waste dump. Still is. Still is. Yeah. yeah. It's just a little, they're down the road. Yeah, but radioactivity does not affect the kind of radioactive waste. <laughs> so, although the site in Louisiana, I remember a few years ago, they were having problems because of. Everything shakes them. Everything shakes them. So they have all this mitigation to keep them mm -hmm. from vibrating. Um, but one of the things that was like overloading yeah. here. Just when a tree fell 20 miles yeah. away, it would go. <laughs> and it just would send the thing going. All this crazy shit that they, that they have to dance out. So Someone drove a car into the, the tunnel by accident once. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Is the, the tunnel that the laser shines down is like, what, a kilometer long? Four kilometers. Okay. That's how far from the mirror. Yeah. That's how far from the Four kilometers that way, four kilometers that way. Laser bounces back and forth between the mirror and the tunnel, and you can see the top down in the background. All four kilometers up. Yeah. So that sort of makes sense in space more? Yes. There, there is a, a mission, hopefully, coming up called LISA, which, um, if you were to do, like, you know, you know, revenge of LIGO. It's uh, LIGO in space. So it's you send up three spacecraft and you shine lasers between them and they fly in a big triangle pattern that's sort of rotating slowly in space and you measure the relative distance between them. And yeah. So the tricky part there, instead of pumping down each time into, into vacuum, is that you have to get the, the spacecraft to fly in formation um, so that you keep like the same distance between the mirrors at all times. So we actually kind of do know how to do that, which is there's some very smart people who really wrote some awesome. very long textbooks on how to make things fly <laughs> in space very well. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, the, that mission has kind of been delayed a little bit. But they're, they're launching, they've launched very they, much they've, longer yeah. this, right? Where they're trying to like, test the technology and make sure it works. What's it called, Lisa? Lisa? Yeah. So that's, that's funded and it's going to get it is. It has the funding to keep doing, like keep the lights on in the offices, but not to build everything yet. So it's one of those things where they might get the green light, and then a whole ton of people will get a whole lot more on their uh, on their plate at work, and you know a lot more deadlines. But uh, right now it's sort of trickling along. They're doing like they're just I think yeah there was the Pathfinder mission where they had I think literally it was a spacecraft that went up that had like two bricks of like I think it was lead or gold or something that they just let go of next to each other and just saw if they could like fly with them perfectly there in space and that was it might not sound very exciting but a really exciting technological proving mission. But they've done that before with other spacecraft. Yeah. It's not the first time. But you have to do it more accurately than you've been able to do it in the past yeah. to do these stuff. Um, but it's this kind of crazy. They call it like drag free, drag free flight or something like this. And essentially you, you have some object that's like in free fall in the center of the space it doesn't touch the spacecraft anywhere, but you have to steer the spacecraft around it. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't touch it. <laughs> Which is like, ah, this, that went so wrong. Yeah, this, yeah. Was actually <laughs> another, this was actually another way that we um, detected, nice. or that we proved some of the elements of uh, general relativity, yeah. was we had a spacecraft going around the Earth with a gyroscope in it spinning that we uh, didn't touch. And then after a bunch of orbits and a long time, we looked at very carefully at the gyroscope to see how much it turned relative to the spacecraft. And all that relative turning was because space-time itself was being dragged along with the rotation of the Earth. Same. Same like the 
that about half as well as they were hoping. Um, but that was because it was still so cool. They made when they spun up the jellyfish. Yeah. Was it on a laser strip or was it like a No, it was like it was a, a spinning physical pitch right? so, so sphere. This is what we freak out about over donuts and coffee because, <laughs> well, we think it's super cool, rather. Uh, it's not our jobs to freak out about them, but. I guess maybe we could feel one more question. Anyone? 